This is the common conception of the gravitational field, varying by the inverse square law, shooting out a spray of gravitons as the source of the force of gravity. As the gravitons spread out through space, the same number pass through an ever-increasing area. Therefore, gravitons must exist, and Einstein's idea of a curved space is undone. Not quite true and that is the reason general relativity has not been swept under the rug of physics history yet. There is a problem with the inverse square law when applied to the gravitational field. It is fundamentally wrong. The flaw is childishly simple by the standards of physics. Why Einstein did not point it out is something of a mystery. The error is distinctly in his favor and it's not something he would have missed. I'm quite sure Newton would have found it embarrassing to have his description of the force between two bodies misused. He simply said that the force of attraction between two bodies varied directly as the product of the two masses and inversely as the square of the distance between them. That is to say, the force between them decreases by the inverse square law. The force, not the field, varies as the inverse square. On the topic of fields, Newton framed no hypothesis. In fact, the concept of a force field was invented by Faraday in his work with electromagnetism in the 19th century. Newton knew nothing of fields except that they be of wheat or barley or grass. The problem with the inverse square law when applied to the gravitational field is that it presents a mathematical impossibility. That is, if we attempt to multiply two masses together whose fields vary as the inverse square, we get a variation of the fourth power, not the second. The rules of algebra require that we multiply both the top and the bottom of a fraction to get the correct answer. So if we want to keep r squared in the denominator, we must add the numerators, which also does not produce Newton's equation. We may add the numerators and thus keep the denominator if and only if we add couplings as numerators. But then we are not adding fields, we are adding couplings of masses, whose force does indeed vary as the inverse square. Decoupling Newton's equation yields the stark truth that the gravitational field of a massive body varies inversely as the distance, a decidedly linear variation. This is exactly the variation required by Einstein's theory of curved space and the reason the error is in his favor. One may account this discrepancy as trivial, but it is not. It is monstrous in the extreme. All that we know of the physical world is predicated on the supremacy of logic and mathematics. All physicists agree that the universe they study must of necessity be subsumed by mathematics, not the other way around. If this is not so, we are back to reading tea leaves and using dowsing rods, or perhaps we could roll some bones and consult with the runes. This is why no gravitons are found, and why they never will be. The space around a massive body is curved, and varies inversely as the distance increases in the linear manner. So now that that's settled, let's dig into the interaction itself, and see what causes the other shoe to drop. In a different video, I conjectured that a particle moved around randomly by an uncertainty principle and that because its field couldn't respond to that movement instantaneously, it took on the appearance of an ellipsoid with a particle at one focus. Because its field determines the probability of where the particle will move next, taking on the ellipsoid shape weights that probability in favor of a return to the former position. Thus, the acceleration of a particle creates the mechanism of its own confinement. And this is what inertia is, the interaction of a particle with its own field. 
Under isotropic conditions, a particle has no net propensity to go anywhere. However, if we place it in a space that is curved, like near a planet, the random movements of the particle favor a path toward the gravitating body. This is because the lateral component of any motion of the particle relative to the planet is curved in the direction of the planet by a net probabilistic distortion of the total field, the composite of its own field and that of the planetary body. Every time it moves laterally with respect to the planet, it gets slightly bent. The sum of all the bends keeps the particle accelerating toward the planet. As it accelerates, its own field is distorted until it reaches an equilibrium, thus moderating the acceleration. That is, it moves downward with constant acceleration. This is easy because it's very obvious once you stop applying the inverse square law to the field instead of just the force, as was originally intended. My conjecture is that the quantum of movement, as applied to a particle, is that it must move an average distance equal to its Compton wavelength, approximately 10 to the 60th power times per second. Why this number? I won't explain that in this video, and it doesn't really matter for our purposes here. Suffice it to say that it moves a bunch. At this point, we can see why there wouldn't be a singularity at the center of a black hole, and why gravity equations, if made correctly, wouldn't generate infinities at their limits. Because the motion is quantized, as the particle approaches the body it is attracted to, its quantum of motion loses its lateral component and retains only a vertical component. The vertical component has no geometric reason to follow the curvature of the gravitational field. We can see now that the vertical component is the source of the nuclear force. When the particle is about one-half Compton wavelength from the singularity, any further motion will take it further away from the singularity. That is, the vertical component is repulsive at one-half Fermi, just like the nuclear force. When it's at just one Fermi, it is maximally attractive, and as we retreat from the supposed singularity, the attraction caused by the vertical force falls off much faster than the force caused by the lateral component. Here's the math. At any given position relative to another body, a particle is n Compton wavelengths away from it. In the next jump, considering only a vertical component of one Compton wavelength, it will be at either n minus 1 or n plus 1 distance away. Because the attracting body represents an asymmetry in an otherwise isotropic field, the net probability of going in that direction is greater by the factor shown. So when n is 1, the particle has an infinite probability of going toward the singularity. However, in practice, the probability of being exactly one unit distance and moving one unit distance vertically is infinitely improbable, even at 10 to the 60th jumps per second. Hence, we can be certain that one Fermi is the distance at which the nuclear force is greatest. At n equals one-half unit distance, we get a probability of negative one-third, which I interpret as meaning that in the next instant, the particle will be farther away, a repulsion. When we assume the quantization of movement under the blanket of the uncertainty principle, we get simple models of inertia, gravity, and the nuclear force, which satisfy our desire for a unique theory that answers to the observations without any extra baggage.